now we can start. Um, welcome everybody, at least I assume there are some people because I cannot see a lot of you uh, with the lot. So if you have any questions, feel free to shout instead of wave because if you wave, it might be that I can't see it. Um, so what are we going to do in the next hour? Uh, I'm going to give you a tour of the advanced ACA features. So we start with the basic features. So even if you don't know anything about ACA, I hope you can still follow along. Um, and I give a, a bit of a high overview of what's possible with ACA. And so if you expect like a really deep dive into ACA, maybe this is not the best place to uh, get that. Um, because there's a lot in ACA and you cannot deep dive into all the topics in one hour. And the content I'm presenting today um, is normally like a four day course, um, but you're all smart people. So I expect you to uh, learn it in, one, in an hour. So shouldn't be a problem. Um, so what are we going to talk about? This is basically what uh, the agenda is for the next hour. Um, questions are here positioned at the end, but feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions and I'll try and answer them directly. Um, so I'll just start with the first topic. So why should you even use ACA? I mean, is it another of those new frameworks that is hip and cool? Um, or is it uh, even a bit useful? Um, so the most common use case for ACA is uh, to build um, highly concurrent applications with lots of users. And the advantage of ACA is that you don't have to worry about the concurrency. ACA is solving that for you. So you don't have to do all kinds of nasty things in Java to make sure everything works concurrent. Uh, it's basically all handled by the framework. Um, so if you have an application with like two or three users, maybe ACA is a bit overkill. If you have a large applications with hundreds, thousands of users, uh, and you want to have fast response times, then ACA is a good solution uh, to it. Uh, so it's concurrent, but it's also really uh, good scalable. And uh, later we will see why, uh, because ACA is using clustering and other concepts that make it easy for you to add extra hardware um, to your application, basically. Uh, and the nice thing is, they have a really nice way of handling errors uh, with uh, within ACA. I won't dive too deep into that uh, today, um, but the error handling is quite nice. So you have like supervisor strategies, and uh, if one of the actors dies, uh, you can decide for yourself what should happen. Should I start a new actor? Should I uh, kill everything? So there's basically like a supervisor strategy to handle actors. Uh, and it's, I think it's nicer than doing lots of stuff with exceptions. And what I like most is, Normally, when we build applications and we connect to other systems, then mo most of the times we're using REST nowadays. Or maybe you're still using SOAP if you're in bad luck. Um, but even REST, it feels a bit strange. I mean, you have to define REST endpoints so you can connect to that application and you have to consume the JSON and then transform it to objects. And it's all boilerplate code you're making. And the only reason you need it is to transfer some stuff over the wire. And uh, with ACA, I will show you later that it's really easy to get stuff over the wire without using REST or other, any other stuff. And I found it easy to use. Of course, that's a bit a personal um, subjective opinion. Um, maybe after this session, you will say, man, it's way too hard to do this. I don't like it. But I think it's uh, quite doable. And the nice thing is um, I'm showing the examples in Scala, which can also use Java to program it. So if you're an experienced Java developer, just use ACA on Java. It works perfectly fine. It looks a bit nicer in Scala because it has some uh, nice features for it. But in Java, you can do the same. Um, small disclaimer. I don't make jokes about America or anything, but um, the code I show you and the examples I put on GitHub, you will see a link later. Um, the code is meant to be easy to understand. And therefore, I sacrifice some good programming uh, ideas. So I do some nasty hacks to make sure I can explain the concepts without having to write lots of code. So for instance, I'm sending strings around instead of uh, using case clauses, which I will show you later. Um, so don't use the code I'm showing you in production. If you want to really write good ACA code, you can look at the ACA examples. But for me and a lot of my colleagues, those examples were a bit too hard uh, to grasp at first, uh, first time when learning ACA. So that's the reason I made some simpler examples. Okay, so enough talking. We'll start with local actors. So a local actor is an actor that runs in, in one JVM. And so we have the actor running on a JVM. We can have uh, thousands of actors running on, on one JVM. This time we only have one. And what we do is we send a hello conference message to the actor. 
and the actor will then print the message. Okay, so that's basically what we want to have functionally, but how does it look like technically? Um, so this is in, in Scala, but I think it's easy to understand for you as well. So we define a worker which extends actor, and then we have to define a receive method. So the receive method more or less says what the actor has to do for a certain message. And in this case, uh, it doesn't bother wh which messages we get, we just want to print it. So this is everything uh, we need for an actor. And when we then want to use the actor, you need the stuff that is put uh, down below. So we need to create an actor system. You can give it any name, basically. Um, and we can then ask the actor system to get a reference to one of the actors. So in this case, we have a worker actor. And we can simply say, OK, system, which is the actor system, give me that actor, and we get a reference to the actor. OK, now we have an actor. We want to send messages to it. It's really simple. Just use the exclamation mark, and you can just send the string to it. The string will enter the receive method, in this case x, and it will be print. So really simple. And to show you this is not just um, part of the solution, I mean, this is how it, oh, i make it a little bit bigger. Uh, so this is the actor in code, and this is the startup. So that's all we need to do. Uh, startup, by the way, extends from application, so that we know it's an application. But we don't even need configuration for this. It just works out of the box. So it, it's really simple to use. So that's uh, like the basics of actors. Um, the cool thing is we can also do remote actors. So if you have two JVMs and we want to communicate between them, we can use actors to communicate. And Maybe one JVM is running on my Raspberry Pi and the other JVM is running on my laptop. Doesn't matter, I can just communicate with those two. So how does it work? We have an actor on JVM1, we have an actor on JVM2. Um, so in the first example, I said, okay, I want a worker actor reference. So this is for a local actor. And now if we want to have a remote actor, uh, to access a remote actor, we simply uh, use context actor selection and we supply some stuff like the name of the actor system, IP address, port, and the name of the actor. So there's some basic configuration. If you do it nicely, again, you would probably put this in a configuration file instead of in code. But to make the example easier, I put it in the code. And then we can use it exactly the same way as that we use the local actor. So we're still just sending messages to it. So I don't need to defi define any REST endpoints of other or uh, other endpoints to access the other JVM. I can just use it the same way as a local JVM. And that makes it, for me, really easy to program without all the boilerplate code. To get this working, we do need some configuration. But basically, as you can see here, it's mainly copy-paste configuration. It's all like standard stuff. You need a remote actor ref provider. Um, some transport method, hostname and port. So most of the times you can just copy paste it, maybe change the port or the hostname, and you're good to go. So nothing difficult there. Um, so what are we doing here? We implemented a start message, and the start match message contains hello conference. We send that to the coordinator actor, which is running on the first JVM. The coordinator actor will then send a worker message um, with this text to the worker actor. And the worker actor will send a worker response message to the coordinator actor. And that's basically how it works. And to show you how that uh, looks like, let's see. Uh, uh, so the, thing, the only thing you need to do is, um, if you want to send messages across the wire, of course, both sides of the wire need to know which messages you are sending. And so if you want to send a starter message, that starter message object has to be known at the sender and the receiver part. So what we did is we basically created um, sort of a simple library with um, case classes. So these are the messages we're sending over the wire. So this is a bit of configuration which is needed to send messages back and forth. Uh, so we can send a start message, a worker response message, and a worker message. And now I s uh, simply have strings in my messages, but you could put in whatever you want. So this project we included in both uh, the sender and the receiver, basically. And uh, if we look at the coordinator, we see the simple configuration you saw on the slide. Um, 
So here we import the sh shared messages. Apparently uh, IntelliJ isn't loading them well at the moment. Uh, so these are the messages that we need at the front uh, and the backend mainly, or server client, just how you want to name it. Um, so this is basically the same code again as when using local actors. And when we have the um, coordinator, here we simply say, okay, get me the worker actor ref to the worker actor uh, on this uh, IP address and this port. And then we can send a message to it. And uh, yeah, we have the worker actor. So maybe you're now curious how the worker actor looks like. So the worker actor itself, it, it looks the same as, as any actor. We define a receive method and uh, we define which type of message I want to receive. So in case I receive a worker message with a body, then this will happen. Quite easily to understand, I think. And um, here we just simply say the same. Okay, we want uh, uh, the worker actor to be active and that's it. So there is not a lot more configuration if you want to work remotely with actors. It's mainly the to define the messages which, which you're sending. So I really like that model a lot more than, than using REST or SOAP or whatever uh, other protocol. Okay, that's a good question. So the question is, what would be the wire protocol? Um, the wire protocol by default is ACA over TCP. So they implemented their own protocol to communicate with it. Um, if I understood it correctly, you could also run it on UDP if you define that. Um, so they basically made a low level protocol to do the message transport. Uh, so that saves you from doing HTTP calls, for instance, when using REST. So it, uh, the performance should be better as well. Um, okay, we had this one already. Um, Another thing which you, when you look at the examples, uh, it is handy to know how scheduling works. And uh, they have some built-in scheduling, which works really easy. Um, so here we say we want a scheduler from the system and we want to schedule once. So that will only happen once. Um, and it will happen after one second. And what will happen is the schedule receive actor will get the tick message. So you simply are sending a message to an actor. And then in the actor, you define that you want to receive that message um, and then what body you have in that receive method will be executed after one second. Um, or if we want, we can also say, okay, we want to schedule it not once, but we just want to schedule it. And the first one should happen after zero seconds. And then every five seconds, uh, there will be a message talk sent to the schedule receive actor. So a really easy way to do scheduling within ACA by just sending messages. One disadvantage, you can only use it for like durations of time and not for a fixed point in time. So if you want to schedule something at like five o'clock, you want to run a backup or another job that you want to run exactly at a specific point in time, that's not possible by default, but there is a nice Quartz implementation for ACA which you can use to do that. Um, if you look at clustering, so I already said, yeah, it's really easy to scale. Uh, and scaling is mainly uh, possible by using clusters. So what we can do is we can run multiple actor systems on maybe different hardware or even the same hardware. It's just what you want. Um, and we can just, yeah, now we have three, but we could also decide, okay, we have too much load. We just add another four or another five or whatever. So then it's, it's nicely uh, distributed. Um, and how does that work? They use uh, so-called seed nodes. So the, the seed nodes are the entry points for all your other nodes. If another node comes up, it will register itself at the seed node, and then um, it is known within your application which nodes are available. Uh, so of course, if your seed nodes crash, you're screwed up because then nothing will happen anymore. So you need enough seed nodes to make sure um, that doesn't become a, a single point of failure, basically. So never do a single seed node. Um, seed nodes are, are quite easy to configure basically. What we do in the configuration file, which uh, I've shown you before, where you've also had to configure the remote actor uh, support, we can also just say, okay, I have a cluster with seed nodes, and here I just give them the actor uh, system name and the IP address and the different ports. So this way you can easily set up the seed nodes for your cluster. And what will happen then is if, if we have uh, two seed nodes, when the first one pops up, so the one on port 2551, it will say, okay, I cannot find my body on 2552. It isn't working. 
And if we then bring up the second one, then both will say, okay, there is another member and uh, everything's up and running. So we're good to go. All the seed nodes are live. And uh, yeah, we can do whatever we want now, basically. Um, and then we can bring live a coordinator node. And so the worker node is doing all the work. And from the coordinator, we're just dispatching the work, basically. Um, what we can do then is from the worker node, we can send a register worker node or register worker message, sorry, to the coordinator node, and then the coordinator knows which workers uh, are available within the cluster. So now the coordinator knows we have uh, basically these two actor systems running. So that it, that's still quite a bit of configuration. You have to register yourself and, and make sure everything works well. So that feels a bit too difficult, too low level. Uh, well, maybe for, for the ones who uh, like difficulty and low-level stuff, they're maybe really happy with this. Um, but there is an easier way to use clustering as well. And that's by using routing. And what routing basically does is uh, it's doing load balancing across your actors. So here we, we define then the load balancer. And here we again have our actor systems uh, with the actors running on different JVMs. Um, again, we configured it quite easily within um, the configuration file. So the router is defined here, and we say it is a round robin pool, so we will send a request to each node one by one. Uh, you can also use other uh, routers or router configurations. So there is some configuration available, um, which will send messages based on the load the nodes are having. So if a node is already quite busy, then uh, they won't get any new messages. So that's also a configuration that you can make. And the easy part is you just do this in the configuration file and uh, it all works. Uh, if it can be changed online, the number of instances was the question. Uh, you need to restart the app for it, I believe. I don't think the configuration is picked up live. So. Um, if you want to change this configuration, you would probably have to reboot the coordinator actor. So the rest of the cluster can, can remain online, but the, the actor system which is using this configuration will need to be restarted to pick it up. Uh, at least I don't know that, uh, that it will pick it up live. Of course, you could programmatically make sure that you, list, uh, that you read the configuration file every hour or something like that, and then read in the values again. Uh, but I don't know if you if you do it live if it will work as well. So I think you have to reboot it, but you can try it out. <laughs> um, so we say we have the cluster. So some some default configuration here, and we can get going. So if you now again have the coordinator actor, and we will send a message. In this case, just an empty string. I don't really care what message it is. I just want to demonstrate the cu cluster capabilities. Uh, so we send an empty string. Um, to the empty string actor on the f uh, first JVM, or JVM2 in this case. The empty string actor will send an empty message back, and what I do on the coordinator actor is I simply keep a hash map of the host names and the counters, so I can see how many messages are processed by which node. So that's easy if I have an example, and I will show it in a minute with my Raspberry Pi cluster. So after we have sent the first message to JVM2, uh, we do round robin, so now if we send a message, it will be sent to JVM3. Same goes for JVM4. And of course, we get the messages back and we fill our hash map with the number of calls we're having. Uh, so to demonstrate it, I could have used, of course, a, a few applications on my uh, computer and just uh, turn them on and then distribute the messages, but I thought that wasn't really cool. And since Raspberry Pis are cool, I brought a couple of Raspberry Pis. Not nicely in a nicely enclosure, so I had some colleagues that called it a piece of crap, but okay, it works. So this is a collection of uh, Raspberry Pis, the bit faster ones, the Raspberry Pi 2s, and a couple of Raspberry Pi 0s. So the Raspberry Pi 2s, there are two of them, they're the seed nodes, they're the quickest, so they can handle it easily. Uh, and we have uh, three of the a bit slower Raspberry Pi 0s that can handle uh, the load as well. So what I now do is I simply, um, uh, so the, the stuff I just showed you function, uh, functional wise, I will now execute it. Uh, so the messages will be sent to the different nodes, of course, if the demo is working. Uh, 
So we see here how many messages are processed per IP address. So this is sh showed every few seconds. I think we're almost done. So you see here that the load's evenly distributed. We use round robin, so every node has handled the same amount of messages, or one has handled one more, but okay, if you have um, not the same amount of messages as um, the amount of nodes, then you will get some differences in it. But this is how easily uh, you can send messages uh, in a cluster. Um, so to do this, you need a bit of more code uh, to keep track of the IP address, and uh, that's basically some uh, yeah some code to fill a hash map. Um, so I won't show that code. I will show you the code that's just sending the messages across because that's the most important part, and that's less code, so it's easier to understand for all of you. Uh, so let's see which one. Uh, this this one. So this is the 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 router part, so the backend part where we have multiple nodes of. So this is running on my Raspberry Pi. We have the application configuration, so the stuff, now we have a cluster actor ref provider instead of a remote actor ref provider. Remote part is basically the same, uh, and we have some seed nodes. And we have the Scala configuration, here I retrieve some port numbers to make sure it is running on the correct port, but for the rest it's, it's just uh, getting a reference to an actor. And we have a worker ref, uh, which is basically the same as we've seen before. If we get a message, we will simply print it. So there's not much difference from using local actors or remote actors or using clustering. It's mainly just a bit of configuration that is being changed. And if you look at the part that is calling this, uh, this application, it's basically uh, most of the configuration is the same. Um, the only difference is here we de define that we have a router and that we want to do routing because in the calling part we have a router, the stuff that's running on the Raspberry Pi of course it doesn't need any router capabilities. Again we say what the seed nodes are and that's it. Startup again, simply retrieving a, uh, a reference to an actor and we can get going. Uh, so here is uh, a little bit part of, uh, with scheduling. Uh, so what you see here is I schedule that uh, after five seconds, every second, um, there will be a send message sent to self. And self means the current actor. So we're now in the coordinator actor. So the coordinator actor will receive the send message. Um, and here we have defined that if we receive the send message, I will want to send the router, the message, test message, and a, a simple counter so that I can uh, see how many messages are being processed. So this is basically an everything you need to build a, a cluster with routing capabilities um, and the, the ability to just add extra nodes. So you can just live add extra nodes and those nodes can just register to the seed nodes and you can directly use them without having to restart your entire uh, application or all the applications running on the different nodes. Uh, so I think that's, r that's a really powerful capability uh, and it works really nicely. And by the way, not working for Akka or anything, so I don't have any commercial benefit telling you how great it is. Okay, so we have a, a cluster running, but maybe we want to have some uh, stuff running only once a day. For instance, w what I said before, uh, we have the database backup and uh, we want to run that only once. We don't want all our nodes to do a database backup and because that, then we do the same stuff over and over again. But we want to make sure that that database backup is always running. Even if one of the nodes fails, I still want to have my database backup because else if my um, server burns down, I lost data. So what we can do is we can say we have a complete cluster and uh, the singleton is running somewhere on the cluster. And that seems like a bit of magic, but the thing is what, what happens is there is one actor which is the singleton and that will always be the singleton during the lifetime and as soon as that actor dies, the actor systems will then start negotiating a new singleton actor. And that new singleton actor will be created on the oldest node living in the cluster. Uh, yeah, but what I say here, you can use it for instance for scheduling, caching, backups, or anything. 
Um, so how does it look like if we again have the same example with the cluster? Um, now this JVM2 actor system is chosen as the actor system where the singleton actor is living. Um, so when we again start sending messages from the actor on JVM1, it will be sent to this one because that's the singleton actor. We again keep track of how many messages we receive. Uh, and when we send a second message, it is again sent to the singleton actor. So with clustering, we had the routing that every time another node was chosen. With singleton, it will always be sent to the same node. So we keep on continuing until that singleton node is crashing. Then the other nodes will start communicating with each other and will pick a new one. And in this case, the one on JVM4 was the longest running node and will then be chosen as the new singleton actor node. And we receive the data from there. And we, then we can continue using that um, actor system for the rest of its lifetime. So now that's the singleton. And we can just keep on continuing. And to show you that it really works, because I mean, I can talk about it, but uh, maybe you don't believe me. Um, so what we basically have is the same code as I've shown you before. We're sending messages to uh, to the router or to uh, to the ACA actor systems, um, but now we're sending it to the singleton instance. Uh, if we now start, I have to look because I will pull out one of the cables, but I have to be careful to pick the right one. Uh, so we start the test run, and now if everything works correctly, only one node should reply uh, to the messages we are sending. And so we see node 1, or 81, it is responding. So now I just simply pull out the power of node 1. So it won't respond anymore. Uh, the actor system, we see some warnings. Oh, it's unreachable. There will be some negotiating, so it takes a little bit of time. And after a while, we see that node 2 is being picked up as the new singleton node. So it's just continuing with its work. So it's a nice way to make sure that something is, is really happening. I mean, I could have chosen to run an actor system on one node and just let that do all the singleton activities. But if that node dies, then all those activities stop working. And now I have failover options because it is just running on the entire, uh, yeah, all the nodes that are being uh, active at the moment. It uh, depends on how you implement it. <laughs> By default, um, uh, you lose uh, a few. <laughs> uh, but something, uh, I, uh, sorry, I didn't repeat the question, I believe. So the question was, uh, what happens to the messages sent uh, when an actor dies and the new actor singleton has to be uh, decided? Uh, you, you lose a few messages, uh, but you can solve that, for instance, with uh, using persistence or something like that um, and make it uh, yeah, really resilient. Um, so, okay, we can do clustering, we can enable multiple nodes. So if you have a high volume of loads, we just put on uh, lots of extra Raspberry Pis or maybe actual servers um, so th that the load can be distributed. Um, but sometimes it's difficult to distribute uh, the load or you want to make sure that certain requests are handled by a certain machine. Um, maybe if you now, yeah, we're talking all microservices and uh, database per microservice, uh, and if the database is the bottleneck, I mean, we can add extra nodes, but it won't help. The database won't get any faster. But we could decide that um, every microservice, which we implement in ACA, of course, has its own database. Um, and maybe even for the same functionality. So say we have functionality to transfer an amount of money from one bank to another bank. Um, and we have one database. I mean, that's not scalable at a certain point of time because that one database is the bottleneck. We could also decide that we have multiple microservices that each serve a particular request. So only for users that have uh, a last name starting with A, B, or C. Um, so we divide the stuff we are processing in smaller units. So we create a microservice that handles uh, all first names with A, B, and C, uh, a microservice 
that handles the request with DEF, etc. So they're all handling their own stuff. They all have their own database, so database is no longer a bottleneck. That's, uh, in short, what you can do with, with sharding. Um, so basically we're dividing uh, the actors over a cluster in partitions. That's basically what we do. Uh, and we call those groups shards. Um, and we can program it ourselves. So we can decide for ourselves uh, how we do the partitioning in shards. Uh, so for instance, I could have chosen that um, we have an even shard on JVM2 and it will get all the even messages. And we have odd uh, JVM uh, on tree, which will get all the odd messages. So that's a simple way uh, to do sharding. If we look at the code, we see that it is, uh, you need a bit of configuration for that. Uh, let's see. Uh, so here is the configuration basically uh, for our shards. So the, the beginning doesn't really matter. That's mainly to do some port configuration. Um, but here we basically we define what should happen in, in which case. And we define a shard resolver. Um, so so we, for this we need a bit of code. Huh? Because logically you want to define your own shards. And you cannot just hard code it or uh, configure it easily because you may, may want to do it on first name or on company or whatever. Uh, and you can define it yourself with, uh, with a bit of coding. So, but this is a bit more work than, than just using a cluster. A cluster has many defaults which are working quite nicely. And if you want to use shards, you need a bit more configuration for it. Um, Okay, so yeah, we have all those actors, really cool, we, we keep on sending messages across, um, but I mean, what happens if an actor crashes, like we for instance had with the singleton actor? Or what happens if we want to store data somewhere? I mean, most applications store some data somewhere. Um, and there's also support for that within Akka, with Akka persistence. So basically, we can store actor information and we can recover after a crash. Um, and it is possible to take snapshots. I will talk about that uh, in a moment uh, with an example that's easier to understand. So if we start with an example without persistence, so what will happen if we don't implement persistence? When we have a COBOL message and we send that to an actor, and the actor is keeping a list of the messages he is receiving, um, after that, we send a Java message to the actor. So now the actor has two messages, Java and COBOL. We have a crash and a restart. We get a new actor, and when we send Scala to it, only Scala is in the actor. So we lost all the previous messages. And I mean, probably nobody would care if COBOL would get lost, but there are still some Java programs in here, I assume. So we want to fix that. So how do we do that? Um, within persistence, uh, we say that the stuff that's coming in within the actor is a command. So now we have a COBOL command coming into the persistent actor, uh, and we have a journal. And in a moment, we will see what the journal is doing. So the persistent actor is sending an event. So no longer the command that we just seen, but an event. So it can contain other stuff than the command that came in. And the event will be stored in the journal. The journal will give an acknowledge to the persistent actor. And after that, the persistent actor will also have the information in it. So this is a simple way to just store data in a journal. We do that with, with Java, so we have both the COBOL and the Java event in it. If now we again have a crash at the exact same time um, with the two events in it, um, the following will happen. All the stuff from the journal will be replayed by the actor, so the actor will just process those events again. So we again have COBOL and Java in our actor. And then when we add Scala, we have COBOL, Java and Scala. Uh, so basically what we want, except for COBOL then. Um, if you have lots of events and you have to replay all of them, there is a, a bit of a performance impact. Uh, it's lots of small events and it will be handled uh, quite slow if you have a lot of them. And what you can do then is uh, make snapshots. So what happens is um, we can s simply store a set of 
elements from the journal. So for instance, the state until event C++, so those two events from the journal, uh, we simply store them in a snapshot store. Uh, then we add Java, and if we then have a crash and a restart, we can simply first replay the stuff from the snapshot store, and afterwards we can replay the stuff from the journal. Uh, we could have optimized this, of course, and, and removed COBOL and C++ from the journal because it's already in the snapshot store, but for an example, it's, uh, I think, quite okay. Um, so COBOL and C++ are, re are replayed from the snapshot store, and Java is replayed uh, from the journal. And then we again have the same solution. So you can choose to use snapshots mainly for performance reasons, but you don't have to. You can do everything with a journal. Uh, and of course, we want to have Scala in it as well. Um, okay, so actors, remote actors, it all works really well. There's only one disadvantage. With REST, you can simply communicate with other systems, maybe even with a C-sharp application or uh, another language application. Uh, with the actor system, it's, it's really tight. You cannot just call an actor from another language. Um, so what do we do then? We still have uh, the need for some HTTP stuff. Uh, so what we can do is we can create an actor with an HTTP instance to connect to the evil outside world, and then the rest of our system is just running with actors. So as soon as you want to have an endpoint, for instance, because you have a JavaScript front end or uh, a, another party that requires you to define a REST interface, you can still do that um, and communicate with them. But Kudos isn't, of course, to not do that and just run everything with actors, but I mean, it's not always possible. Um, so finite state machines, uh, lots of applications, they have like a process where you, you go to registration and maybe you can go back one page and you can change some information uh, and then you can go forward again. So it's basically some states and some events to change between those states. And of course you can program all those um, changes from state and events and to a new state um, with all kinds of if statements and stuff like that. But that's not, it's not really nice and it is hard to test all those different transitions between the states because you ideally want to test all the transitions. So with finite state machines, we have state and events. And in this example, uh, I made it like this. So we have a few states, we have a new project, we have an in progress project, and we have a crappy project. Um, so what happens here? If we receive a no progress event, we will stay in the same state. If we receive a progress event and our counter, we keep track of a counter, uh, is two, then we also stay in a new project stays. Uh, if we have progress with an iteration, so progress and iteration is a message, then we go to the in-progress project. Uh, so basically, uh, we get a, a few iterations until we had uh, two, the second iteration, then we will stay here. So here we get the, the message work harder, then we get the message good job, wrong direction, so project is failing, you should use Akka because then your project won't fail anymore. Uh, you're improving a little bit, but still in the wrong direction. You st still should use Akka, of course. But, I mean, after two failed attempts, you should just get another job. And uh, let's see how that looks. I just realized I didn't show you the code for doing persistence, so maybe we'll start with that. Uh, so for if you want to use persistence, you have to configure like a journal, or some kind of database or something, to store the events, of course. Um, so I, I chose to use LevelDB, uh, but you can use all kinds of databases uh, to store the events in. So that's something you have to configure. If, if you don't configure this, Persistence won't work. Um, uh, let's start with the actor. So what we have here is we have uh, a few commands, uh, but that's not the most interesting part. Uh, here we keep uh, a list of the states. Um, so this was the list where COBOL, ACA, uh, and Java were in. Uh, if I first start uh, with the receive command, so if we receive a new command, so the command Java or Scala or whatever, um, it will be persisted and we do an update state. An update state is mainly uh, adding something to the list. So we get an extra item to our list. 
So we keep on continuing persisting stuff and adding stuff to our list um, until there is an exception. And what then happens is the receive recover method will be called automatically. And receive recover, here we say, okay, we have an event and we want to replay that. And it's again, just updating the same state. It's just filling the list again. So it is a bit of code like this basically. Uh, and of course the update state, but I mean, you need that anyway, if you want to add something to a list. Uh, but to build in persistence, you need like these four lines of code and, and, uh, and, and a little bit here. So in a few lines of code, you can persist anything. Um, and I mean, I basically persist uh, the data I'm getting in, but I could also opt to just persist a subset of the data. If I'm uh, transferring stuff over the wire, I'm only maybe interested in the, in the customer IDs. Uh, if I do a uh, bank transfer, I'm not interested in somebody's home address or something like that. I mean, that data uh, shouldn't be persisted. We just persist the data that we need. So you can choose whatever you want to persist. And if we then look at the, the finite state machine, um, so no configuration in here, it's uh, quite simple. Oh, for persist, I didn't show the startup, as I promised. Um, so this is what we do. Uh, we send the command COBOL to the persistent actor that will be persisted and put into the actor, then Java. Then we throw the exception. So without persistence, then the list will be empty. Uh, but because we have implemented persistence and the replay events, uh, the list will just uh, the new actor will just get the information from the journal um, and and this is the example where I don't possess stuff uh, and it will just be thrown away so it, it's quite basic uh, stuff to get working with uh, with persistence if we look to the finite state machine so we saw that we had a few statuses uh, you know, we define it as a trade uh, and then we create objects for the different statuses. And we can then say, if we are in a new project uh, status, when in the new project status, because we start with the new project status and counter is zero, um, we can say, okay, if we now receive an event with progress and two, uh, we say, okay, get another job. Uh, but if, if progress is, is it doesn't matter, but not two, uh, then we go to in progress project. So this way we can easily say, uh, when to transfer to another state. And we can even uh, supply information with it. So the counter is supplied with it and will be up updated during the runs. Um, the nice thing of the is, is, is that it's also easily testable. So you can easily test how the transactions are working between the states um, or the transitions, sorry, not the transactions. Um, so it is a lot easier to test uh, finite state machines than writing all kinds of if statements to do all the transitions yourself. Um, and we see here that there is an on-transition as well. So if we go from a new project to an in-progress project, we will also print this line. So we can change states, and if we are changing, we can print stuff or do actions. And when we are in a state, we can print stuff. So you can basically do anything around uh, states and yeah, these, these things. So on to the conclusion of this really fast introduction to uh, uh, lots of features from Akka. Um, yeah, you can use, use it with Scala or Java. It doesn't really matter what you want. Uh, I like it a bit better with Scala. Uh, you need less code and it feels a bit more natural. It's easier uh, to define what to do on which message. So pattern matching works a lot nicer. But you can do it in Java. We've done projects with that as well. And you could even do it in .NET if you would want to. Um, I think it's quite easy to use, uh, but you have to keep in mind some features are a bit more experimental than others. So uh, be sure to check out what the status is before you're using the, these things in production. Most of it works quite stable, uh, but they tend to change uh, some stuff now and then. For instance, Akka HTTP was fairly new and they changed quite some things on that uh, during the road. So be careful with that. If you want to check out the examples, they're in this GitHub account. If you have any questions, you can tweet me as well. Um, you can also ask them now because we have plenty of time left. Any questions? 
Yeah. The compatibility of .NET ACA and uh, JVM ACA. Okay, so the question is, what's the compatibility between .NET ACA and JVM ACA? Um, there's no compatibility is the easy answer. Uh, it uses all Java serialization or other serialization, you can configure that, uh, but it's quite tightly coupled to your programming language. So you cannot easily communicate between actors on different uh, uh, languages. Thank you all for showing up and uh, have a good day. <laughs>